Hello everyone, semi-retired Bob here. I talk about the carnivore diet, all things related to the carnivore diet, and miscellaneous odds and ends. Today we're going to talk about part two in our basics series. We're going to cover dairy and electrolytes. And then if we get to it, I've got another topic, depending on what I get to as I walk around the block here. It's another beautiful day here in Omaha, Nebraska. It's 83 degrees out. The sun is kind of starting to hide behind the clouds because it's supposed to storm tonight. So we'll see what happens. For those of you new to the channel, welcome. I'm glad you're here. You might be asking yourself, what in the world are we watching here, Bob? Well, you're watching me walk. I know that doesn't seem super exciting, but considering a year ago I couldn't do this, I think it's a pretty good deal. A year ago, I could barely stand for two, and two to two and a half minutes without severe pain. Now I'm out here walking almost every day. I do do a lot of other stuff that I didn't used to do. I'm doing all my own yard work again. I'm going over to the Y and working out, both in the pool and with some weights. Got to stand here for just a minute because there's a guy getting ready to leave his driveway there. Um, so that's what you're watching here. Um, so the whole point of this channel is to show you that it's never too late to change your life. I just turned 60 and here I am out walking around doing things that even, you know, just a year ago, I never dreamed I could do, but, you know, even, you know, 10 years ago, my health was bad enough. I never thought I'd be able to do this kind of stuff again. So, it's been pretty good. For those of you returning to the channel, welcome back. I'm glad you're here as well. Well, let's go ahead and jump right into this. The thing I forgot to talk about yesterday with uh, the basics of the carnivore diet is dairy. Because dairy is a very individualized subject. Some people do just fine with whatever dairy they can get their hands on. Other people not so much. So you can go about this a couple of different ways. You can either start off on a fully carnivore diet with all the all the foods and then if uh, if you're not getting the results you want start cutting things out the way I think would be the preferred method is to start with something very basic either lion diet which is just ruminant meat salt and water that may be a bit much for most people so I would start with beef butter bacon and eggs and then after you've done that for 45 to 90 days, go ahead and start adding things back in to see how it affects you. But you need to know what a non-inflammatory diet feels like before you start adding things back in so you can tell if, you know, if something's affecting you. But yeah, dairy. Some people do just fine with all of it. You know, they can drink milk and and have cheese and cottage cheese and all different kinds of cheeses and their body deals with it just fine. Other people have to limit it. Some people go all the way down to where even butter, very few people, but there are a few people that butter even gives them a little bit of a reaction. So those are the people that have to use ghee, clarified butter, as their added fat, so they don't get that reaction. It's, I can't say definitely this is what you should have, this is what you shouldn't have, because dairy is one of those things that everybody seems to have different level of tolerance to. You know, if you're lactose intolerant, you probably know that already. 
But what about all the other stuff? The other dairies that you can have when you're lactose intolerant. You may find that some of those are affecting you in a negative way as well. So just be real careful with dairy. Take it slow and easy. Like I said, I would start with an elimination diet like beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And then slowly add some things back. You know, start by adding back just your favorite kind of cheese as a little side dish with your meat. Or your favorite kind of cheese on your eggs to make a little, you know, sort of an omelet thing. But uh, as Dr. Barry says, once you're weaned, no one should be drinking milk. But again, if you don't have any problem with it, I don't see anything inherently wrong with it, but milk is very fattening because whole milk has sugar in it. You know, mammal milk is designed to make the baby mammals grow. And, you know, what's the one thing that, that babies put on a lot of early? Baby fat. And then as they start to get weaned and start eating regular food, their body generally tends to, to burn off that fat. As they're adjusting to solid food, they need the, the nutrients of their stored fat. That's sort of why that happens. At least as I understand the science. You don't need to correct me if I'm wrong. I get a lot of things wrong. I'm not a science guy. We all know Bob gets into trouble if he tries to do science. But that's... That's my thoughts on dairy. You just have to... I said, it's not, that's not very good advice for you to follow. Because it's really hard to talk about dairy. Because, you know, some people do really well with it, some people don't. Some people can have one or two very specific kinds of cheese. Some people can have all the cheeses. So it's just... Mm, a little piece of leftover beef there. Yeah, it's late enough in the evening. I've already eaten. But, uh, yeah, so that's dairy. And to quickly interrupt this uh, beginner's discussion, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago I told you I was going out for little walks after dinner just to see if it helped with my digestion and my sleep. And it seems to be doing that. You know, I've done a lot of other things. You know, I've added the Cerule products. that could also be helping my digestion and my sleep. And that's not a cause and effect claim. Purely a coincidence. I have, I make no cause and effect claims on this channel. Everything I talk to you about is just my personal N equals 1 experiment. And things I have observed. So everything on this channel is non-scientific observational stuff. Just wanted to put that out there. So let's talk about electrolytes. One of the things that especially in the early part of your diet, as you're dumping all that inappropriate inflammation, your excess water weight, that can and usually does take a lot of your excess electrolytes with it. And that's sort of what causes the keto flu. And that's not the only thing that causes the keto flu, but that can add to it. And making sure you're getting enough electrolytes can alleviate some of the symptoms. And make sure you don't get deficient. I would start with, of course, salt your food to taste. What does that mean? Well, you're no longer eating all the processed crap that comes with salt in every package. 
and you do the everybody every cell in your body needs salt to function properly you know if I could reach into your body and suck all the salt out of it all at once you would die very rapidly so make sure you're salting your food to taste what does that mean well you'll have to play around with it a little bit early in the diet I would salt a little heavier now of course if you taste your food and you're like whew wow that's way too salty then back off just a little bit but for the first couple three weeks of your diet don't be afraid of that salt shaker and then just to be sure you're getting enough on the other things I recommend the the keto chow daily minerals but you can use whatever electrolyte additive you want and, you know as long as it's got potassium and magnesium in it along with some more some more sodium and chloride you're probably going to be okay you may want to uh, like I said they do have at keto chow besides the daily minerals they have a thing called electrolyte drops they actually have electrolytes in tablet form that you can take there's a lot of different options LMNT element is another company all of those all of those are a little on the pricey side but not horrible or just go to Amazon I wouldn't go for a flavored one because now later on and we're going to talk about sweeteners in another video but later on you may be able to add those flavored electrolytes in just to make it all taste better but to start with we want to get all the artificial sweeteners out of our system as well so we can then tell how it affects us when we add it back in so you can just go to Amazon and pick one that looks right I think I've still got a link down in my description for one that I bought off of Amazon if not you know just pick one I think all electrolytes as long as they don't have sweeteners and carbs and that kind of stuff in them they're all about the same I like the keto chow and I like the element because I know they're clean I don't have to read the I don't have to be an ingredient person with those I can just order them up and I know they're gonna be okay and after you get through the initial dumping period of dumping out all that inflammation you're just gonna to have to play with the electrolytes see how much your body still needs I've been taking one dose of the daily minerals ever since I got home to Omaha just because I was still having some cravings even after almost a year and I don't remember who I was watching but they were talking about a craving usually means you're deficient in something and there must have been some trace mineral that I wasn't getting because I started taking the daily minerals and my cravings have pretty much disappeared I still get a little bit here and there like that cake I had on Sunday that's not really a craving that's a being pre presented with a sugary treat right there in front of your face while you're eating so I wouldn't really call that a craving craving is when you know I used to sit around the house at night or around my trailer down in North Carolina thinking about pizza thinking about gee would ordering a pizza up right now really hurt me that much I've been doing so well that's a craving
And the other subject I want to get into here real briefly while I finish going down this hill and then up another one back to the house from my evening walk around the block is how often to eat. That's another big question that happens. And, you know, as you know, I, I do one meal a day, but I've been at this for a while. I started with three meals a day. I got up, made myself some breakfast, then had some lunch, then had some dinner. Very quickly. It wasn't very many days. It might have been the first couple of weeks or so. I don't remember exactly. It's been a year ago now, and my memory's not what it used to be. But very quickly, I discovered I was not really hungry at breakfast time. So I waited and just went to two meals a day. Now when you go to two meals a day, you're gonna have to make each meal a little bit bigger so that you're getting enough nutrition. And then if it seems like, you know, you've been doing two meals a day for three or four weeks, and you're still hungry twice, that's probably where you're going to want to stay for a while. Just make sure you're getting those two meals in a six hour eating window so that you still get a full 18 hours of intermittent fasting in. And we'll talk about the actual things that intermittent fasting does for you in the next video as well. But uh, if you're at two meals, I would suggest making your first meal much bigger than your second one. Make it seem like you're going to try and do one meal a day, but then have a little something to tide you over to the next day's meal from your second meal. You can reverse that, but the whole thing here is you don't want to get caught in the trap of eating so little each time you eat that you never get an insulin bump. An insulin bump is different from an insulin spike. Insulin spikes are what diabetics get when they eat too much carbohydrate. But a little bit of a rise in insulin, making sure you get that good surge at least once a day, I don't know the science behind it. You can go to Professor K's channel or many of the others and look into it. But the science behind it says that it'll help keep your gut and your kidneys healthier if you're getting one bigger meal a day. And if one, if, you know, one meal a day isn't going to work out for you, you can break it up into two. Just make sure one is significantly bigger than the other so you get a good insulin bump out of it. But you may end up going to just one meal a day, like I did. It's like, I just don't feel like I need to eat more than once. I can get enough food in me in one meal a day, so I know I'm getting that good insulin surge. And that just works for me. But everybody's a little different. So don't feel like you have to be one meal a day or you have to be two meals a day. You might stay three meals a day for a really long time. And that's perfectly okay as long as you're eating three meals in about an eight hour window, eight to ten hour window. And not having little snacks in between. So that's what I've got for you today, folks. Reminder, Thursday, May 25th at 6.30 p.m. Central. I'm going to have a Zoom call for all the channel members. So you still have plenty of time to go down in the description and click that Join button. If you want to. You don't have to. 
it's something extra. You're still going to be able to watch all of my content all the way through every day if you want. Absolutely free. Don't forget, get out there, be 1% better. Today, tomorrow, every day. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you in the next one.